Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Thriving Adoptees podcast. Uh, so today I'm delighted to be joined by uh, by Skylar. Th- welcome to the show, Skylar. And thank you for making it because I know you, you've been sharing that you're not you're not 100 percent feeling 100 percent today. So I really appreciate you making the, 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 the time to come on the show and to to share your stuff. That's great. Yeah, no, no problem. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So could you introduce yourself to the listeners, please, Skylar? Uh, sure. So uh, my name is Skylar Baber. Um, I live in Washington, D.C. Um, I'm currently the head of an organization called Voice for Adoption, um, which exists to advocate for uh, children in foster care who are waiting to be adopted uh, and the families who adopt them. Uh, and I'm originally from Montana. I grew up in the Montana foster care system, uh, spent 11 years in that system before I aged out without a family and then was later adopted at age 25. Adopted at 25. Wow. That's yeah. so, wow. That's incredible. I was adopted by my sixth grade music teacher. Yeah. Sorry. I was adopted by my sixth grade music teacher. Wow. But that it took is, a year. Yeah. Yeah. Because I was adopted at, we've got both extremes here. I was adopted at five weeks. <laughs> oh, wow. You didn't even get to remember the system. No. No, no. Um, you know, like I was in a foster carer for, I don't know, four weeks or something like that. My birth mother collected. So I've heard my birth mother collected me from from that, took me to, to the adoption council, to the adoption agency. And so, yeah, um, my, my life, my early life was a, a cakewalk compared to yours, I, I would imagine, my friend. Yeah, it's a, it, the earlier you get adopted, the more likely you are to have all sorts of benefits. Right. Um, yeah. And the infants and toddlers are the easiest group to get adopted. If you're over the age of five, we actually consider that special needs, meaning that you are going to be hard to place because you're no longer in that category that goes like hotcakes. That's that's terrible, isn't it? Yeah. And that's I guess that's why you're advocating for change. Yeah? Uh, for me, I'm, I'm advocating just because, I mean, you, you talk about you know, your childhood being a cakewalk. Um, my, my life was rough. I went through 11 foster homes, two group homes, two children's homes. Uh, I had over 50 different respite providers um, throughout my experience there. And that's, that's a lot of different families, a lot of moving around, a lot of inconsistency. I went to like, I think I, I counted, I went to five elementary schools, two junior highs and four high schools. Um, so sitting down roots became a problem. Um, experiencing trauma and neglect from within the system that was meant to help me was was a regular. Um, and I just remember when I was younger, like I was in my room, um, I'd gone through, I forgot what I was even dealing with, but I was crying in my room and I just started to pray. And I said, you know, there has to be something better than this. It's unfair. Someone has to be out there to fight for us. And little did I know that I'd grow up to be that person that gets to fight. Um, most people will never know I existed, right? A lot of, the, especially if you're a foster youth, those guys are surviving day to day. They're not able to you know, really see or, or hear beyond their own existence because they're trying to just make it through. Um, but they, if they could know, they should know that there's someone out there that's fighting both, you know, for them and for the improvement of their lives and safety and doing everything they can to make sure that what happens in my generation hopefully doesn't happen to the future generation. Yeah. Wow. I, I, I'm, I'm speechless, you know, I, 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 know some of your story but express like that uh you know hearing you say it it's just like it's uh, blown me away um how old were you when you had that kind of that moment do you remember I feel like I feel like an adult I mean since I was young I was always feeling older than everybody else because when you have to have your smarts about you to survive a system and, and deal with things that most youth don't have to deal with at your age you become older fast um, but I was at that age, I entered the system when I was six and I probably had that moment around about sixth grade. Um, what happened was when my dad went to adopt me, um, he actually tried earlier than 25, much earlier, yeah. um, when I was 12 and they denied him adoption because he was a single male and they told me I was unadoptable. And I had that chance then to have a normal family from 12 on. And I, I, I had it taken from me because of someone else's uh, belief that, you know, single men could not be good fathers, which is completely, you know, my personal opinion is, is incorrect, that just because you're single does not mean you don't have the love and capacity to have a family. Um, and, be, and telling a child that they're unadoptable is wrong on so many levels. 
Um, because when I, you know, when they told me I was unadoptable, it changed my outlook on everything. I, I said, fine, I don't, I'm not able to have a family because I'm unadoptable. You harden yourself a little bit and you just start to get through the system. Um, it's also why it took him so long to adopt me after I was out of the system because he offered again, um, right when I was aging out of the system and I told him, no, I didn't need a family. I was unadoptable. Like I'd gone this long without a family who wanted one after that. Um, and it really changes your identity. It changes who you think you are when you're, you know, it's all in essence to me, it was like, I'm unadoptable. Does that mean I'm unlovable? Um, it, it's, it's kind of traumatizing to tell a child that, uh, but I, I overcame it. I grew up, uh, fortunately, uh, many of my peers don't. Um, and I also know I'm, I'm an anomaly when it comes to statistics, statistics, excuse me, um, of youth in the foster care system who age out without a family. If you don't have a family and you don't get adopted or you don't find permanence before you exit, you're kind of like a, a free floating soul. Like you, you do what you can to survive. You, you tap into different angles of survival, whether that's good or bad. It's, it, it's really not for any of us to say, because if you don't have a grounding source, if you don't have someone that you can go to for Christmas or for the holidays or to ask for help when you're in a financial crisis or a physical illness crisis, you start to kind of just try to find family where you find it. And that's why a lot of um, youth in the system who age out without a family or without being adopted will often turn to crime, will turn to gangs, will turn to sex, drugs, rock and roll, all of it, because they're trying to numb away the pain, survive and find the most stable support they can. And sometimes that support is not what the rest of society views as stable, but they don't know that the alternative to, com you know, to completely being alone and isolated in this world is, is a challenging one. Yeah. What, what did you, what did you um, understand when, I mean, you said uh, they told you that you were unadoptable, which uh, I, I'm, uh, I'm speechless at that somebody would say that. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I, and and you, 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 uh, you use your own kind of, your own interpretation of that um, was the, the word that you used was unlovable. Is that, what you is is that how you would characterize it is what did you understand by an adoptable well so i mean in my industry now i, I understand an adoptable being there, there's actually a legal term that goes with that but it's a different category but when you tell a child that they're unadoptable you know what does what are they supposed to mean they know that they had an opportunity like for me i had an opportunity to go with a family i had someone who wanted to take me had the resources and was financially stable, had a home, had a, a great reputation as a teacher throughout the community. And they denied that adoption because he was a single male and, and told me I was unadoptable, which basically meant to stop looking for adoption. You're not gonna have it, so don't count on it. Um, and that you, know, you, you don't get to have biological family either. So what's that mean? That means that you stay in a system that has so far done nothing but hurt me and had shuffled me from location to location on an average of one move per year, if not more. Um, and we know that moving is not good for youth either. And neither is the trauma that happens when you encounter abuse and neglect in a system that's supposed to be designed to protect you. Um, it, it, it was one of those things, it was one of those moments where I, I was at a pivotal moment. I remember part of me wanted to go what I call like the dark side, right? I'm like, I know exactly what they don't want me to do. And if this is, if they're not going to help me get a home and they're telling me that I'm unadoptable, let's act like I'm unadoptable. You know, I'll show them what it means to have someone who, to be someone who is unadoptable and unlovable. I can behave like that. Um, but the other side of me was, you know, just keep your head down, get through the system. You're not that far from 18. It's only a few more years. Once I get through to 18, I can, you know, be free to do my own thing and everything will get better. Yeah. Uh, things don't always get better when you turn 18. But one thing was for sure, I had my life to control of my own and decisions were my own. And that no one was going to tell me that who I could love and not love. And, and no one could tell me that I couldn't make a family if I didn't want to. Um, and it was, it was kind of one of those aha moments though that I had to harden myself because I, if you're told you're unadoptable or if you're told that you don't either deserve a family or you're you know, too messed up to be part of a family um, because of, of, of your behaviors or the life that you came from, uh, it's, it kind of changes your perspective on life. Like I stopped telling people I was in foster care for a long time because I didn't like the stigma of people be, be having pity for me. Um, I worked uh, my butt off to, to get ahead in life. Like I, I started to mimic success anywhere I could find it. And I, I saw that people who went to school did well in school, got an education. For the most part, their outcomes were significantly better than, than people who didn't. So I just, I started to work hard. I dumped myself into, uh, into school, into uh, sports, into theater. 
into everything I could just to, to get through and also to keep my mind off of the fact that I don't get to have a family. You know, as I just became so busy that I didn't have time to be stuck at that abusive home or in that group home, uh, just sitting, you know, waiting for the next thing. I just tried to find things to keep me busy. And I was lucky that my choice to not fall off the wagon and just go completely, you know, against the grain and just become someone that I, I really wasn't um, and try to cause problems was to do education and education became my lifeline. Um, and it, it's also kind of what drove me, has driven me forward, but I still never got that family. Imagine what would, I would be like if I had actually gotten a family at 12, the, the happiness, the amount of trauma that I could have avoided um, and just the sheer the sheer concept that I had, I could have had half of my young adult life with a family. We know that kids who have families and have stability, have less trauma, have increased potential out, outcomes for success um, in every aspect from mental health, behavioral health, um, education, all of it. So if I'm this today, I'm, I consider myself fairly successful. I have my issues just like everybody else does, but had I not had that additional period of trauma, who would I be? What could I have been? Would it have been something truly amazing? Some Something like a, a powerhouse? I have no idea, but I don't know that full potential because I had it taken from me. Do you, do you question that now? Of course. I, I always ask, like, who could I have been? Like, so when my dad adopted me, he changed my name, which well, that was kind of a little, him and I together were a little bit on ends about that because I was still stuck in the, the, the method of I don't need it to be adopted. I'm doing this because I, I love you and I want to be able to help you during medical crisis and because your mom, grandma would want this to happen. She, she asked me to do this, um, but I don't want to take my name away from this. I want to keep my identity and you keep yours and we'll just be you know one in the same without that legal binding name. Well, he snuck in the name change with the lawyer <laughs> huh. uh, and I didn't notice it until adoption day, but of course on adoption day, I'm not going to say no. Um, and so you know, taking on that identity, it kind of, for a minute there, I resisted it, but it, it was truly a, an awakening moment where I realized that I was part of a family, that that name change meant more than just a piece of paper. Um, it also meant that it was the beginning of a relationship where I became part of a family in the long run. Um, but it also did something else for me too, which was, you know, so, no one's ever wanted me to be part of their family enough that they snuck in a name change before, right? I mean, he showed me that not only did he want me to be part of the family, but it was important to him that that identity be carried forward, that I take on that family name and that I carry it with pride. Um, I think I went off on tangent, tangent there kind of, but. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to change it slightly. I'm going to change tack slightly on this. I, if I can go off at a bit of a tangent. Sure. Because uh, I'm thinking about like the uh, adoptive and foster parents listening to this. Yeah. Um, and I wanted to pick up on what you just said. Your, your dad showed you that he wanted you as part of the family. He, 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 he this, the, the, these, these were, um, this wasn't words. This was this was deeds. I, and, <laughs> like you're in Washington, uh, and you're in Washington. You're hanging around. Uh, you, you, you're doing a, a great. You're great doing a great job in a world where that's full of um, politicians. And uh, words are very easy. One of my challenges with with politicians is is uh, you know wherever they are. I mean, I'm, I I, don't, I probably don't have a right to talk about American politicians, but so let me talk about a British politician. So, British politicians find words very easy. A lot of them have only ever created words. And what I mean by that is, um, they are lifelong. Um, they've not built anything. Usually, a lot of them haven't built anything. They've been lifelong politicians. Uh, you know who are uh, who are concerned with spin or their you know their ex lawyers or their you know all they've ever done is words they haven't actually done deeds uh, and your what your dad did you he, he did the deed and that had a profound effect on you you know he did I mean 
he showed me multiple ways that he wanted to be my dad. One was he continued unrelentlessly to offer the, the, that relationship. Um, even after I had hardened myself and made it through the system on my own, he was that one phone number that I could always call um, no matter where I was, and I could just let him know I was alive. And he was there for those moments. But then after I aged out of the system, he offered again for that connection and I rejected it. So he just held on to the relationship. Um, he would check in with me even when I was terrible at checking in. And I'm still, I am the worst communicator on earth after I get off work. For work, I am there, I'm on it, I respond timely. When it comes to my personal life and my family, I am every, every mother's worst nightmare when it comes to communicating about what's going on in life, what do you need, how are you doing? Um, and sometimes I can go months without reaching out just because it's I get so overwhelmed with my professional life that when I get to my personal life, I kind of neglect it. And I think that's a personal weakness I need to work on, you know, work-life balance. Um, but at the same time, once you, if you've never had a relationship like that your whole life, right? Like you've never had a mom or dad that call you all the time and want to check in daily and, and do all that. It's really, really difficult to break a lifelong cycle of not having to do that. Yeah. Um, and it's also kind of awkward and uncomfortable because I, I'm really bad at talking on the phone about personal life because it's like, well, I have nothing new to report. Uh, that's exciting. What are you doing? And then he talks about something incredibly boring, which I love my dad, but uh, some of his, you know, there's a, there's a generation gap. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And what he considers exciting is not necessarily what I consider exciting. But all I remember as I'm talking to him on the phone is you love this man. He's your dad. Just listen to it. You're OK. You can take some time to do this. What was important about that, though, is, is him holding on and him still calling me every day, continuing to, to, to try to offer that relationship, encouraging me to, to re reciprocate, um, bragging me up wherever he goes, which is, is something I get embarrassed about. But at the same time, I think it's, an, you know, I have someone in my life who's bragging me up, you know, to their friends and community. That's, I wouldn't have that if I didn't have my dad. Um, and it's hard to take the, the bragging and stuff, but at the same time, it's, you know, someone's proud of me. Someone on this planet knows I exist. Someone knows that I was, that I, my life is doing something that matters and they're part of that. And then when you go to get adopted, where you tell them, no, I don't want my name changed because I want to maintain my ignorance and my, and my, my stance that I am independent. Like this is who I am. Uh, and they sneak it in a legal document on the day of your, uh, that you're signing the papers right before a judge and everybody's there watching. At first, I was like, ooh, he's, he's a sly one. That's a pretty sneaky little trick he's got there. But then I realized to me, like, it was, it was a, a big moment where I went, he really, really wants this. Like, it's not just me going into this. This is two of us. And he, is, he wants me to be his son and he wants me to have his name. And when I signed the paper, like, I, I realized in that moment, I'm like, this is legitimate. But this is the first time someone has ever demonstrated what it means to want somebody to me. And I felt wanted. I felt part of a family. And it was a, actually a shocking day because it was a happy thing. It was a, a, on Christmas Eve in Montana. We invited our friends and our family and the judge was actually happy to, to, to do the, the adoption where it was the first time like in a court where everybody was smiling and excited and doing pictures and, and it was crazy. Um, but it was also the first moment where I be, realized that now as part of a family, I need to start you know, kind of moving past the, the trauma of being a, a foster kid and figure out how to do that. And so I did that through sharing my story and working to, you know, to better the lives of other youth in care. But I also did that by being part of a family and being part of his family and taking an active role in that, which I still need to be better at taking an active role. I still, now I'm feeling guilty that I think about it. I haven't called my dad in a while. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. So your dad showed you, you know, and he stuck with you um, and, um, he stuck with you before it was, you know, he was your legal dad. He just kept going. He just kept the relationship going. What, what do you think that foster and adoptive parents need to show their, show their kids? So for me, I, that's a good question. So like, what do they need to show? Um, this is, I don't tell this to many people, but I think this is a powerful way to, to get a message across. Is when my dad went to adopt me, um, especially when I knew it was going to be the real deal and he got the legal documents drafted up. I wanted to basically know that he was in this for, for real, that this was not some joke, that it wasn't a soft offer. I told him everything about myself. I told him my deepest, darkest secrets because I wanted to scare him away. Like I wanted him to know the trauma that had happened to me and what it meant as an adult and what I faced every day when I got out of bed and who I was and where I was headed. 
and he took everything I could throw at him. And he, he looked a little shocked at some points, but then at the other points, he just kind of went, so? Like what, you wanna know my secrets now? Granted, his secrets are like Winnie the Pooh, uh, <laughs> you know, compared to a foster kid's. Um, he, he, he took the biggest scary that I could throw at him and he, he basically assimilated it and said, still doesn't scare me, I'm still here. I think that's what adoptive parents need to be prepared for when you're looking at, especially adopting a child from foster care. Trauma is real. The impacts of that trauma on their lives and on their development, on who they are and, and their outcomes as adult is significant. It's not their fault that they were exposed to that. It's not their fault that they were hurt as a kid repeatedly. Um, but the outcomes in life for those that have been traumatized are significant. They will have lifelong obstacles that they have to overcome, even if they are highly successful to stabilize, to overcome that trauma and stigma and to, to really find their place in the world and in, including in their own body and minds. Uh, and it's, it's so significant that a lot of people are deterred from adopting older youth because they're afraid of the cumulative trauma that's happened to them and that what does that mean for, are they gonna be a terror to have in the household? Are they gonna be lovable? Um, you know, or is it worth it? And I would argue to say that if you are a real adoptive parent that is prepared to, to walk the mile, if this was a biological child, you would never even think twice about giving up. That's what you need to be when it comes to adopting too. When you step in and say, I want to be your family member, nothing that child should be able to throw at you, nothing should be able to scare you away, and nothing should ever make you go, well, maybe not, maybe we'll try another child. Like once you reach that adoptive stage with a, a young person, and if you've expressed that, that it means unconditional love. A family means family. That means nobody gets left behind. It means that nobody gets to back out of a contract just because something gets difficult or because trauma or issues surface or because something really bad happens. It means that you do it together and you have to be ready to face that. And if you have that mentality, that unconditional, ready to, to, to meet challenges head on, I really think that you're gonna be successful at anything you do as a family. Yeah, you're gonna have to deal with some crap. <laughs> That's called family. Right? There is no normal in this world is something else I've learned. There's no normal family. We all have, have secrets in our family. We all have issues and none of us are perfect, but our choice to stay together is what, what is so unique about that. And that's what to me is the defining moment of a family. It's where nothing you can do to the relationship will damage it to the point where the relationship ends. It's always going to continue, even if it gets gritty, you know, there's someone else in this world that, that is considered yours. Yeah. In the in the families that you um, that that you support, you know, the, and, and the advocacy work and and uh, in your professional capacity, do you see a lot of other kids um, trying to scare their their their, their <laughs> adoptive parents and their foster, and their um, uh, adoptive and foster parents away? Well, I can tell you a couple of things. I can tell you that there is really, uh, the impacts of trauma are significant where there are some kids that, yeah, they're really messed up because they've been hurt so severely that it's literally who they have become. And this, I, this person is a product of, of being hurt. And, and if you know the adverse childhood experience study, it's just a, it's a great study for people to be familiar with. It basically says that trauma is dose response related. The more you have, the more likely you are to have negative outcomes, including bad health outcomes um, and could be early death. Um, but when it comes to like kids just acting out, there's two types of kids to me. There's the created kids where we created them by the lifestyle, by the stuff we put them through. And some of their actions are not to get attention. It's just because they are so harmed and disturbed that that's all they know how to do. But there is somewhere behind all of that, there is some logic behind how they behave and why. And that's, that's where a professional you know, psychologist and, and mental health professional to help you figure out. But that doesn't make them a bad person. It makes them a hurt person. And they need healing and, and love just as much as anybody else. But then there are the kids that, you know, I, I have trauma, but my trauma comes out in way different ways. Um, when you're just trying to be a bad kid or you're trying to be a kid that gets attention because the only way that you've ever gotten attention is because you know if you act out that someone will finally pay attention to you and that negative attention is better than none at all. You know, that's where you have to start to look at, at those kids too and realize that one, they're going to put me through the ringer, right? If they want me to be their family or we want to be family with them, they need to prove that they're not going to leave me or leave the child like every other foster home before that has left them. They need to prove that, you know, what family means is, is that we're here through thick and thin, through all of it. And so, yeah, you may see a perfectly normal child acting like a terror, but they're not going to be consistent. 
And there will be moments when you'll see that you prove that you're staying. You'll see modifications of behavior where little by little that child will warm to you and be ready to go. Uh, and in general, I don't see people trying to blow homes at all in the adoption community. Um, I see people struggling to maintain their families because they don't have the proper post-adoption supports in place to deal with what happened to that child as a young person that surfaces later in life. And that's often what happens is you don't necessarily see the damage done to a person just by looking at them. You see it develop in them as they grow and as they develop and as their DNA expresses itself and as the trauma expresses itself on that. Uh, it, it's, it's often cut off later. And, and there's, that's a misnomer too. People think that just because you get a baby um, right out of the, you know, right as close to out of the womb as you can with before the age of five, that that trauma isn't gonna be a problem, that they aren't old enough to remember. I can tell you that that's not true, right? We know that if a person is put through trauma in their formative years, that trauma expresses itself in many different ways and it often starts to develop and show in their teenage years and then just goes on from there. So even babies who have not been able to comprehend what they've been through will express trauma later in life. It's, it's just part of reality. Um, but in general, they're not trying to be bad kids. I'm not a bad kid, I wasn't a bad kid, but I had moments where I could definitely, you know, put people through the ringer. Um, and I sometimes I needed to do that just to protect myself. It was a mechanism to keep people at a distance because if I allowed myself to get close, they would just leave me or hurt me again. So that distance was important to my protection. Um, yeah. So you, you mentioned the post adoption support. Um, where, where do you see hope in post in post adoption support? What or, or what? Um, I'm not sure what the right question is. Um, this is this is tricky stuff. You say the trauma um, the trauma is, is real. Um, where where's the healing in the post adoption support? What what yeah. what where where should where should parents be looking? I would say that so I mean it sounds scary, right? That you're adopting someone who's been traumatized and and there's all the stuff that you're gonna have to face. And and unfortunately, I'm a realist, so I do not sugarcoat the adoption process or or the trauma to overcome, but there is potential. Um, you can instill, just as you can instill trauma, you can instill resilience. And you can do that by teaching them the reverse of everything that's been done to them, right? Where you can teach them and show them how to be confident and how to be caring and how to show empathy and how to show compassion um, and show pride in a good way and, and teach them good touch versus bad touch, right? Because sometimes, you know, kids who haven't had a hug, I think that all physical contact is sexual or wrong and, you know, won't know how to express that. Little things like that, that you have to be consistent, repetitive, and have a, you know, have a methodology to instilling resilience is to me almost by what, what's the easiest way that you mentor them in a way that you show them how it's done. You don't just say it. You don't just give them a book to, to write it. You demonstrate that this is what it means to be resilient. And, and in many ways, like my, my adoptive dad coming back to me and every time he offered to be adopted, he was rejected. Seeing through that rejection and being persistent, that persistence and that constant will to, to want me as part of his family that is one way of demonstrating love, right? He, it took me a while to see that. I was a kid who had to grow into an adult before I finally comprehended what the heck he had been doing for all those years. But when I got it, I got it. And that can change everything. And it will take years sometimes to get through some of these issues. But resiliency is something that can be instilled and can be encouraged. But it's gonna take the whole family or uh, maybe sometimes a specialist to do that. And, and for post-adoption, Post-adoption isn't just for the child, it's also for the family. We need people to talk to in this world, right? We need people to teach us skills on how to handle new things um, and to see the world differently. And sometimes that's the biggest issue I think that families have when they adopt a child, specifically from foster care or an older youth, is the different worldviews, right? And if you have a different worldview and you think the world should operate and be this way, and the child has been through a whole nother world and thinks that the world operates in a different way, and you try to force your views on him or, or get that cultural lens to just magically clarify itself, it doesn't work that way. You have to start to speak the same language. And that's to me what post-adoption supports can do is it can help both the child and the family start to get in a common language, a common behavioral pattern and a method that works for both of them without you know, having to give it all up or have to go totally down a, a different path. And there's also the fact that when we say we need to talk to people, 
everybody needs to talk to somebody and that sometimes you don't know how to handle your own emotions from what you're seeing. Uh, and that can be, how do I express love, right? Like I want this person to be part of my family and I don't know, I tell him I love him. He doesn't get it. Um, I demonstrate it by, you know, I buy him nice things. I spend time with him. He's still not getting that I'm part of his family. Like what can I do to truly show him that I'm here and, and what do I need to be saying or doing? Uh, and, and counseling can help you think through processes. It can help you get stuff from, out that shouldn't be kept in. Um, and there are a lot of different types of supports that can be put in place down to even giving you respite from each other, where maybe you've been going at it so hard trying to make this family work that you just need a breather just for a minute to help get your head clarified. And you do not want to send the kid into foster care or give them up. You just want to just get a minute to breathe respite is sometimes a vital option. It's like a vacation from your issues for just a minute, but then you come back together as a family and you start focusing on, on them again. Those are just as important as the family itself is making sure you do self-care and that the that you both get the help that you need. Yeah. I love the way that you said, and I'm scribbling notes as we uh, as we talk here, Skylar. Um, I, you said at the, at the, 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 the first kind of within the first couple of sentences in the answer to my last question, you said it's doing it's doing the opposite. What did you say? Do you know what you said? Yeah. So, I mean, if you've been traumatized, right, it's doing the opposite of what caused that trauma. Right. It, it, it's 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 going out of your way to, to teach them the basic facts of life, you know, and in your family, which is you're not always at risk of being harmed. You're not going to be hit in this family. You're not going to be abused or, or treated like you have been, even if you try to make us mad, even if you run away and you, you have to show them that. Yeah. So it's a really simple way of remembering it. Like it's the opposite. You've got to look, you've got to look for the opposite of what, uh, the opposite, you've got to understand what the child's been through and then look at what you can do that's the exact opposite of that. That's, that's one way, I think it's oversimplified, but yeah, there's also this method, this helps me. So I used to walk around the world when I was younger thinking about what's wrong with these people. Like you'd see people that are just acting like crazy that are doing things that you can't believe they're doing. Like there's the homeless guy on the street that's, that's, that's speaking in gibberish, that's you know throwing something at people. And why does he act like that? What's wrong with him? It's not about that at all. If we can look at someone who's acting out in a weird way and try to put ourselves in their shoes, try to understand what happened to them, it changes our whole perspective on the issue. Like, it's not what's wrong with them, it's what happened to them. So then if that's what happened to them, caused them to go there, what needs to happen to them to get them out of that? Because we are pliable. P people can change, our brains can change, the way that we operate, it's all fixable, well, for the most part. Um, permanent damage is a whole other deal but if we can look at the world through a view of what what happened to people instead of what's wrong with them it'll change the way that you interact with each other it'll change the way that you view world issues and it'll change the way that you feel about people that you see on the street or kids that you experience that might be pushing your you know to the limit because your limit changes when you realize that this isn't their fault they're just doing what they that what they're used to or what they know um and your limits change because you're willing to do more and go further within yourself to, to try to help them overcome that. Yeah. Uh, it's an interesting one. You talk about the, uh, the, the, the damage uh, piece. I was talking to uh, uh, Robbie. Uh, so Robbie is a Canadian um, mom, mom uh, who's uh, 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 adopted from foster care and she has kids with FASD, right? Um, and I was saying to her, because I'm very interested in this, this idea of, you know, what you're talking about, um, pliability and flexibility of the brain. Does this have what? FASD? I'm not F F F F FASD, fetal alcohol syndrome. Oh, gotcha. Understood. Okay. Yeah, it's my strange uh, British accent. Um, and also that maybe I'm not um, <laughs> pronouncing it right. Uh, so I, I was saying to her, well, can I... Are, are there moments of peace, you know, are there moments with a kid who's got FASD when they are at, at peace or is it, is it constant war? And she said, yeah, there are, there are moments, there are moments of peace, you know, um, and I'm, I'm thinking that's what we need to build on. 
we need to build in 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 the kind of like the peace amongst the you know the 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 the, the trauma um the 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 behavior the um the tough stuff in between in between even somebody with fsd even even in between the, the, the it's kind of what the, the, the they call it in music it's the space it's the space between the notes that makes the music you know we need to be looking at the uh, building on building on the hope putting a shining a light on the hope on the hope the moments when there are peace and calm and when we're not um at a hundred miles an hour uh and when we don't feel like we're going crazy that's what we need to focus on that's where the the hope is and as i'm saying that i'm thinking does skyler think i'm going a bit nuts D does that make any sense no i don't think you're nuts at all i i agree with you that finding that spot is is a very powerful way to focus on things I think it's a little more difficult for some to find that 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 the calm in the storm um, at all times, but they do exist. And I think that it's finding the small moments, like just having an idea of, you know, does this feel good and does it feel right? It's also helping the youth I realize those calm moments. And how do you do that without exciting them? Um, you know, because it's if you're not used to calm, if your whole life has been survival, fight or flight calm moments can be very, very uncomfortable. I know when I was growing up for a while there, when it got really quiet and really like, I don't know how to put it, like it, when it got really gentle and quiet and soft and just kind of like everything was happy, something inside of me was going, oh my gosh, this is so uncomfortable. What is this? This is scary. This is new. Like, I don't know how to handle this. You need to do something before you blow. Like what's gonna happen? Yeah. Um, but wow. at the same time as an adult, now I love my calm moments. I love the quiet. I, I don't mind being alone with my own thoughts and my own myself. Uh, but it took me a lot of growth to be able to be at peace with myself because that part of me still exists in there. That kid that has been panicked, that has been living fight or flight is still in the back of my mind. It's part of my perception and my, and who I am. He just, just doesn't go away, but he has to learn how to live with the rest of me, which is the other parts that developed because of that. And my coping mechanisms to deal with trauma and, and to oversee, you know, get past the stuff that's just hiding in the, in the shadows of my mind. Um, but it's possible. It takes time and it takes, um, often it takes investment, right? Investment in both time, love, mental support, uh, investment from the state and the, the government, depending on what they're supporting. Um, and it takes everybody working together to find that peace. But we can undo, you know, it's kind of like undo the damage of war. When something has been broken or shattered, we rebuild. And you have to take the time and be willing to do that for a person and inside of a person. And it, it takes more work than a lot of people are expecting. But once you do that, if you are uh, one of those families that has been through a lot, that gets to see your child go from a, someone who has gone through a lot of really bad things, develop into someone who is at peace in their mind and part of the family and you know is able to not only survive in this world, but thrive, it changes everything. And that's also why you hear of stories of people fostering 30 kids and adopting 13 of them. and. You know, it's because once they see it, once they get it, they understand that they can do it again. And they want to give that gift to as many people as they can and to not let anybody slip through the cracks. Unfortunately, we can't all fix everybody uh, and we can't have families that big all the time. But for those of you out there that, you know, are that type of family that have been through so many broken, broken children that have grown up to be successful or survived just enough to, to have a life worth living, you know, you guys are doing something significant. You guys have the potential to change a life and you're not only changing their life, you're changing every life that they impact. Yeah. So you had that idea back when you were 12. Is that right that, that you, you were going to turn this into something better? Well, I, find I was, silver lining? yeah, I don't know. That's when I was crying and hoping that someone would fight for me. Um, I had no intention of going into foster care advocacy or adoption advocacy as an adult. I just, I didn't even know what I would be doing with myself. I stumbled into this line of work. Um, after college, I told people, I wasn't really telling people that I grew up in foster care um, because there was a lot of stigma with that. People would always wonder what, again, what's wrong with you? Like what, you can't keep a family? Like you, what, like what were you doing that made you have to be so like bouncing around all the time? And it just wasn't it at all. It was what was happening to me that was the problem. Um, I actually found my, my career path by accident when I took an internship. Um, 
with an organization that basically they, they hired former foster youth who had good and bad lived experience. They taught them different skills like speaking, public speaking, um, how to deal with biological family, um, how to mentor, and, and they basically believed in the power of youth voice. And they trained me and sent me out as a national public speaker around the country to foster care conferences where I became a mentor for other youth in foster care. Um, and I shared my story and leveraged my existence to help them overcome theirs and to understand where they could go as well. So that began the, 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 the beginning of my story where when I was in the internship, I had a kid that was a shadow kid, basically a kid that goes to a, a workshop and doesn't say anything. And he looks angry and doesn't want anybody to be around him. Well, I had this kid start to follow me to all my workshops and he wouldn't say anything, but he was awfully angry looking all the time. And he did this for days. And by the end of that conference, it turned out that he you know, had sought me out as a mentor. He felt comfortable around me. And he literally told me that my story is a lot like his and that because I, you know, in essence, because I existed, I changed his perspective. And that kid a couple of years later turned out to be something pretty substantial. He had opened up, he had taken a different path with education. He took some of my survival techniques and tried to implement them in his own. And he became someone that we, I still stay in touch with today. Um, our lives matter. And I think that's, that's what got me hooked on creating change was if I knew that I could do this for one person and all I did was talk and share my story and I didn't have to do anything else. If I could do such a big impact on one person, what could happen if I actually fought to make a bigger change for more people and, and to really create change at, the, at a bigger level? And so I just dedicated my life to volunteering and doing this work and volunteering led to a professional career. Yeah. So um, that kid had a perspective shift. So how do you encourage um adoptive and foster parents to help their kids to a perspective shift? Yeah, um, so I would say lead by example, right? Even when the times are getting tough, introduce them to new people, uh, people that can, that you might think have some really cool skills or can do some really neat things in this world or that you think are, are have the potential to go places. Um, expand their network with yours, um, show them what it's like to have healthy friendships and show them what it's like to make a mistake and then overcome it by doing it, by correcting it and making it better. Or, you know, the easiest way that I can say that my life has, has worked is for the most part, you live by example and you learn by example. And then when you find out what you do right, you can share that with them, but also share in the moments where you're not doing right. Um, and most importantly, hold on to what you consider love, right? Demonstrate what it means to be unconditional. And that, that perspective change comes with time. It can also come with an aha moment. And those aha moments are, are usually something that you have to find in the middle of the storm, I think, usually is where you find your aha moment. And it usually comes for both you and the, the kid at the same time. And where you realize for the first time, like maybe you were fighting over something and you realize that you both had no idea what you were fighting about and that you were both saying the exact same thing and intended the out same, same outcome, but you just didn't know that you were saying it in the same, you know, you weren't speaking the same language. And when you start to suddenly speak and understand each other, that you can start to work together and it changes every future interaction. Uh, look for those quiet moments, the ahas, and, and always look, just maintain that the past is the past. You don't get to throw it away. And you don't get to, you know, forget that it happened, but it is the past and you can create a new future and just stay focused on that, that, you know, this day will pass just like all the rest, but tomorrow there's potential that it can be completely different and it could be, uh, it could be a good thing. And you may not ever find a kid that has trauma. Some kids are really good at hiding it. So just don't worry. Like, I, I don't want people to think that because I'm a big believer in trauma being real, that every child is going to have behavioral issues or issues that you're going to have to face head on. I just want you to be prepared to handle the impacts of what that can mean to somebody that they could develop later in life or may have to have some serious conversations and support from you because they're dealing with something um, coming down the pipeline. Trauma doesn't mean bad behavior. Trauma just means adversity and struggle later on potentially. But that adversity can be overcome with support. Yeah. So be willing to go the distance. The distance um you a phrase i heard a few years ago came to mind in uh, just a couple of seconds ago um and it was the fact that the past is a place of reference not a place of residence exactly yeah no no i agree 
oftentimes uh, it's hard to overcome that past. Yeah, for sure. But you can but build it. You can build it. Um, and there's always hope. And um, yeah, what's the question that I've not asked? Uh, I don't know. I think we've had a pretty interesting conversation. Yeah. So, I mean, talking about from a perspective of adoptive parents and, and families and what they can do, I think that one of the best things you can do for yourself is to understand adversity. So like familiarize yourself with things like the adverse childhood, um, uh, adverse childhood experience study, understand stuff like what is trauma? How does it impact things? But more than anything, become a, become someone who knows how to like see the positivity in life and, and see where in the darkness, where a lot of, you know, former fosters will lie, try to show them the light you know, that there is so much more and brighter things to look at in this world and to do that you don't need to focus on the past because here's what your future could be like. And if you are a person that, as I call, lives in the light, like we know those people that are always happy, that are good people, that no matter what happens to them, they're willing to go the extra mile for others um, and that they can always find the positive lining of everything, even if it drives you nuts and you don't know why that ability to find that positivity and to find the hope and the love and the happiness is, is exactly the type of person that needs to you know, impact someone else's life because that's something that needs to be passed on. And I don't think we pass that skill on enough is to find, it's not just optimism, it's more than that. It's like a lived, not a lived choice to be happy, but a lived ability to be happy. It's kind of like my adoptive dad. He is, I call him Winnie the Pooh because he literally is never unhappy. He's never angry. He never like, has moments where you see him just want to break down, yell and scream. Um, even when he's mad at me, he'll be quiet, but he will not show that, you know, he's the world's anything other than what it is. And he is choosing to be happy in this life. And I think that's pretty motivational to see someone who's been through a lot himself that is just a happy person and he'll live longer and you'll have better outcomes yourself because you're not stressing yourself out so much. Yeah. Can I just run one thing past you on this? Sure. Uh, well, it's a question, really. Um, do you think that we are our trauma? I think that we are a big part. It's a big, big part of who we are. Like, I think that it, it expresses itself in our DNA. And we're actually finding this out more and more that as you grow, there is biological changes on our systems, right? And if it's biological, that's in part who we are, because it's, it's the body and the mind and, the, and everything that we're given. But I think we're significantly a part nature and a significantly a part nurture. I think the nurture has the most powerful ability because it can, it can change everything if you find the right nurturer. So are we our trauma? No, but can we not count our trauma into who we are? Uh, I, I would say not. We have to remember the past to learn from it. Um, but in the future, it can, you know, as long as we can overcome it and uh, as long as we are provided the tools to overcome it. Most of our kids in foster care that aren't adopted aren't given those tools. They're just, you know, aged out and expected to su succeed in society and they repeat cycles or they hurt themselves or others or, you know, any number of things. And it's not their fault. It's because they weren't provided the opportunity or shown how or nurtured enough to give them those skills. And that you can't expect someone who's not been taught or nurtured how to do things differently. It just doesn't work that way. We don't learn to be good members of society just by growing up. We grow up and we trial and error and we have people that teach us what's right and wrong and without that guiding path that parent, that that adult person saying okay that's not right this is this is good here's your money here's your you know that don't do that again you know you trial and error can be open to interpretation by someone just teaching themselves and they'll teach themselves whatever they feel is right but maybe they need someone else's subconscious you know conscience involved in all of this to help them guide their path and that to me is what this is all about right adoption is literally combining of two worlds, right? Taking someone from a different world and then giving them the opportunity to be part of something new. And at the same time, that new world has to learn how to assimilate parts of the old world. And, and I think that's just as good. Trauma, even if you don't experience it, secondary trauma is real. As in, if someone's been hurt, they can their story and their experiences can hurt you too if you don't know how to deal with it. But you can also overcome it. Uh, in a real manner. And there's examples every day, I think that through your show, I mean, this is about thriving adoptees, right? Not all of the adoptees probably have as, as significant of trauma in the past, um, but a lot of us who have had substantial trauma can overcome and do overcome our trauma and live to fight another day and live to, to do really good work. But that doesn't mean just because you see us 
doing good work, that it's all gone, right? That that experience that was us in the past is, is, is invisible. For me, I can tell you that I remember my experiences every day of my life. There's not one day that I wake up that I do not remember one good thing and one bad thing that had happened to me as a kid uh, within the system. And that identity of being a foster kid has been something that I don't think I'll ever forget. Even when I tried to deny it and, and pretend it didn't exist, I knew in my mind and soul that I come from a background where I didn't have a family. I got one later in life. And it's, it's all encompassing. Family is a big part of your identity. And it's not who I am, but it's, it's, who, it's where I come from. So I'm conscious of time. I'm also conscious that um, I want to just uh, give you the chance, you know, listeners out there, if they, is there a way that they can get involved with what you're doing professionally with your organization? What are you, what are you looking for? How, you know, what are you looking for from adoptive parents? How do you support adoptive parents? Why should they get in touch? What, what do you want to, clearly yeah. they, they're in they're in this because they they want to help how can they help you yeah so i think that the biggest way is i mean through my organization professionally is 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 how i've started to leverage my story and leverage my experiences to help foster families and to make a uh, foster adoptive and adoptive youth um we have a project that i think that people would be interested in it tells your family story your trauma or your successes you know, not your deepest, darkest secrets. We don't want to hear that, but we want to hear about your, your journey through adoption and, and what it means to be a family and the things that you've had to face as a family and, and what you've had to do to overcome the past to live in the present. Um, and we want to hear the good and the bad. And we have a project called the, the, the BFA Voice for Adoption. So Voice for Adoption Family Portrait Project, where you would basically um, agree to participate in the project where you submit a family photo and you would write your family story, not a very long one and not a very super in-depth so that you know your privacy maintains privacy, but enough that we get inspired and motivated to, to, to want to celebrate with you or encourage people to take action to make it better for others. Um, and you can write your story, submit your family photo, and then my organization would pair you with your, a member of Congress from your state if you're in America. Uh, if, you're, if you're international, I'm sorry, we, we haven't got the resources to expand that way yet. We are working on, you know, expanding throughout the U.S. and then going that way. But right now we're, we're U.S. based. Um, but if you're in America, we can we can definitely pair you with a member of Congress, help you to elevate your story to the national platform where, you know, they they highlight your your family story and photo during National Adoption Month by keeping it in their offices or on their social media. And your story gets to become part of a collective force. Uh, of change making, where day by day, the more stories that we can connect our leadership with, the more potential for impact. And if you have an important story uh, or lesson to be learned from your adoption process, that is the most important thing we can do is to tell your story. And that's what we're about is, is helping you to do that. So if you're interested, you can check us out at voiceforadoption.org. And you can go to our projects page and find the, the Adoptive Family Portrait Project or the Family Portrait Project. Great. Uh, I'll, I'll put a link in that. I'll, I'll find that uh, on the site and uh, I'll put a link in the show notes because I know the people are listening uh, to this while they're driving or walking the dog if they're me. Um, so you can go to the show notes and you don't need to try and remember that uh, a URL. Uh, is there anything else that you'd like to share, Skylar? No, thank you for all you do. I think that you're part of the, the same process that I'm fighting for in my professional careers. You're telling their stories and you're telling our stories. So thank you for letting me share mine and, and for sharing parts of yours. And I think that this narrative and, 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 and method of continuing to, to pass on from generation to generation, our lessons learned and our hope, I think it's really cool. So thank you for all you do. Thank you. I really uh, appreciate that. And I uh, thank you to listeners for, for listening and uh, we'll Absolutely. speak to you very soon. Thanks a lot. Okay. Bye. Thank you.